My name is Bob Latina, and welcome to our first of a four-part series of eye presentations focusing on applying the PROACT root cause analysis methodology within specific applications. This will be part of a quarterly series for the year, and the first one is going to focus on downhole oil well failures. Okay, for those not familiar with downhole wells and producing fields, this is a basic graphic that gets across the major components of the well the surface casting, the cement, production casting, tubing, packer, and as you can see the oil comes in through the perforations and is brought to the surface uh, at the pumping well itself. Okay, as is often the problems, we have a lot of failures in our working environments and we have to be able to quantify and prioritize which ones are more important to follow now than others. Uh, in this particular example, and this is an actual case, the failure definition for this particular population of wells, there was actually about 5,000 wells at this site, and the focus of this opportunity analysis only was scoped around 200 of those wells. But we were looking for any interruption of production at one or more of these wells. The end result of the compiling of data, looking at past histories, failure histories of these, was aggregated into an opportunity analysis, and we found after adding in the frequency of failure times the cost per failure, this would take into account labor cost, material cost, and lost profit opportunities by being down that period of time and not being able to sell at that time. Now this gives you the prioritization from highest to lowest of what the results of that opportunity analysis were. As you can see, we had lead line ruptures, which means the lines on the ground, for whatever reasons, were rupturing and that was costing $777,000 for this population of wells themselves. Now it's not important the numbers or the, you know getting into understanding what types of all these failures are. What's important is the distribution. Is that now we've been able to identify what we refer to as the significant few. These are the 20% or less of the events that are costing you 80% or more of your losses. It's important from a big picture perspective to understand that over a year's time as opposed to looking at the failure of the day or the failure of the week and just keep chasing that in a short term perspective. Uh, that often will uh, hide the real failures that are costing us most of the money over the year's time. So this gives us the candidates for root cause analysis over the long term. This is an example of a logic tree. A field team was put together to look at one of those particular types of failure. In this particular case, uh, it was rod failures. This particular team from the field was put together to look at specifically rod failures. I'm going to switch programs here, and I'm going to switch out to using the software tool that we used with them. And I am going to switch here to a presentation mode so I can make it a little bit easier to see. Our event in this case, which they were concerned about most, was from the business perspective, I'm looking for recurring non-producing well failures. And the ones that they identified that were the most impactful, the most expensive, the most frequent, uh, were due to power failures, tubing failures, pumping unit failures, rod failures, motor failures, and subsurface pump failures. Now, as you can tell, each of these really uh, is a separate analysis in and of itself. Uh, this particular team, with their specialty, was focusing on strictly rod failures. So that's what we're going to pursue. From an RCA perspective, we would start asking the question, how could we have a rod failure that would result in a recurring non-producing well? Well, first we have to determine, are these rod failures above ground or below ground? So each of these hypotheses, and that's what the H stands for, now have to be validated with hard data. If I was to go ahead and click on any of these hypotheses, I now have to have a verification log filled out. Mm -hmm. And the test for this particular hypothesis would be to review past rod failure data to determine where along the rod the breaks are occurring. The outcome in this case says that the review of failure data over the past 12 month period concludes that 96.5% of all rod breaks on this well fell below the ground as opposed to above the ground. And then, of course, everyone always likes the physical evidence to be locked on to this so that we can attach pictures or reports or failure data, anything we want to support that record. What I want you to know is that beneath every one of these hypotheses, 
we should have supporting documentation about how we did the test, what was the outcome of the test, and then link, file link, any attached documentation. The zero to five scales here represent confidence factors. Uh, based on the evidence that we do have, a five means that we're absolutely sure this is true. Again, based on the evidence that we do have, a zero means it's absolutely false. Anywhere from zero to five represents shades of gray due to inconclusive data. So let's quickly follow through the path here, and we will say, how can I have a failure below ground resulting in the rod failing, resulting in a non-producing well? I can now break this down into mechanically related or operationally related, and this is what the team had come up with. Now keep in mind here, I can have operationally related failures that do not result in a mechanical incident. So therefore, in, in the data that they were collecting, they were not finding anything due to strictly operational. But they did have evidence of the rods failing themselves and the fractured parts so that they knew they had a mechanically related issue. How can I have a mechanically related issue? Well, if I break down the system into its subsystems, I have pins, I have the body, and I have the box. Now this is a positioning as to where would this failure be occurring. The majority of these failures were occurring in the body, so they refer to these as body breaks. How can I have a body break? I can have a body break from corrosion, I can have it from scale, I can have it from fatigue, I can have it from erosion, or the phenomenon of erosion corrosion. Okay, we send off these parts, these failed parts, we have the metallurgical review, and our metallurgical review comes back and cites fatigue as the primary contributor. Questioning continues the same. How can I have fatigue resulting in a body break? I can have fatigue due to normal wear and tear, or it can be a premature failure. Again, you go out, you collect your data, you find out that it, is it actually normal wear and tear, because we rarely see that in our working environments where our parts actually last as long as they're supposed to, and they find that in this case it is definitely premature wear. How can that happen? How can I have a premature failure resulting in a body break? Well, we want to check at this point, are the parts correct for the service or are they incorrect for the service? We want to be able to sort out and make sure that we ha what we are using is what we're supposed to be using. We don't want to make that assumption. So in this case, they do confirm that the parts that they are using are correct for the service. So how can the parts that we have being correct for the service still fail prematurely? And now we're getting into an operations component. At the operations component level now, we're saying that the way that we're operating our well in relationship to what the parts can take, it would be seen as improper. So how can we have uh, improper operations? We can have improper operations from overstressing, from stretching the rods, improper speed, and bumping the bottom. Uh, bumping the bottom is often referred to as a tactic of operators in the producing fields. So they collect their data, and in this case, they prove that they have both overstress and improper speed. And because the logic follows the same path for both, uh, we will follow that logic underneath overstress for both of them. Question becomes the same. How can I have overstress? And my hypotheses now from the team are I can have that the pump is sticking, I can have a pounding of the fluid, I can have a paraffin buildup, I can be running it too fast, and I can be pumping for too long a period of time. They collect their data, and they find in this case that the speeds that they are running are too fast. Now you'll notice that I have a HR, which represents a human route in this case, because it is a decision. So when we look at errors of omission or commission by the human being, someone is choosing to run at the speeds that they are running. It's not important as to who, but it is as important as to why. Why do they think it is okay to run at that speed? So now we're looking d uh, deeper into what we refer to as the latent roots or the organizational systemic issues that contribute to that decision. We could believe that the pump is bigger than it is. Through our interviews, we find that that is not the case. That is not the belief. But now, as you see, all the LRs, the latent roots on the uh, rationales for this decision, uh, the engineer said to run it. You know, that's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a worker bee here. I'm an operator. The engineer tells me to run it. That's what I do. There's a push to maximize production. You know, we're, we're doing everything we can, production rules. Uh, we, we're making money right now, and we want to maximize our output. So there's a mentality. The paradigm is push production. Uh, there's the need to lower the fluid level. So me as an operator, recognizing that, I will increase the speed. 
there is a lack of time to change the speed because we're under such great time pressures I don't have time uh, to go ahead and make this adjustment and then there's the paradigm that that's just the way that we do it uh, often people will take this paradigm they don't even know why we're looking at this now because we've been running this way for years and nobody's said a word so now that we're looking in detail at specific failures people are saying well you know why do you do that <laughs> and oftentimes people don't know why they do that we've done that just because we've always done that so what I wanted to be able to show you was the questioning process of not taking things for granted and being able to demonstrate the impact of systems on our decision making which trigger a series of consequences all the way up until it affects our business so now I am able through a cause and effect relationship be able to roll backwards imagine if you had a videotape of a failure uh, you had the luxury of that you're, you're walking backwards frame by frame with evidence to back up everything that was occurring instead of just coming up with opinions and assumptions as hearsay so this now gives us a solid path to failure we can now spend money wisely on getting rid of the particular uh, causes that we've identified uh, with the confidence that it will stop this particular incident from happening again so with that and to be able to go through not only the methodology but where it's been applied in actual field situations. So I hope this was a value to you. Uh, we'll see you in another quarter. Take care.